Before we start today's show, I just wanted to mention our sponsor, Wealthify. Wealthify is regulated by the FCA and is a multi-award winning online and app-based investment service founded in 2016 and owned by Aviva with a simple mission to make investing accessible to everyone. You can invest from as little as one pound and Wealthify offers a number of investment products including a stocks and shares ISA, a general investment account and a personal pension. However, Wealthify also offers a junior ISA which allows parents to save for their child's future through investing. Wealthify also offers ethical junior ISAs and the ability for family and friends to pay directly into its junior ISA account for the child's benefit. In the run-up to Christmas, this could provide a meaningful and eco-friendly alternative to present buying. With investing, your capital is at risk and you could get back less than you put in. For more information, head over to moneytothemasses.com and search Wealthify. Hello and welcome to episode 348 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, welcome back. How are you doing? More to the point, Andy, is how are you doing? You you always start the show is asking me how I am, but this, yeah. this week I'm going to start the show by asking you how you are because, well, t- you tell the story, Andy. Anybody who's been following our Instagram stories will be well aware of Andy's mishap. But for those who haven't been following our Insta stories, make sure you do if you're not. For those who haven't, then fill them in, Andy. What what happened this week? Well, first of all, I'm disappointed to say that we're having to record this remotely. As situations have changed and we've been able to get into the office more, we've really enjoyed being able to record the podcast in person together in the same room. And it, it does bring a different dynamic and I really enjoy it. But unfortunately, I have had to record this one remotely and that's because I picked up a little injury. Uh, it's an embarrassing injury and I'm just going to cut to the chase. I, I basically tore my calf lightly jogging across the road and even more embarrassing than that I had a dog under my arm because Lola my dog was I was taking her out for a walk and the reason I had her under my arm is because I forgot her lead to take her for a morning wee and so in my wisdom I found a dressing gown cord and was tied that to her basically it was an absolute car crash of a a mad 20 minutes on Monday morning where the whole world was against me (laughs) and it all went wrong (laughs) well first we knew was andy had come into the office i said he'd forgotten the lead didn't know what to do used a dressing gown call took lola for a walk picked her up because he was obviously worried about the security levels of said dressing gown in, in, in in keeping lola from being run over ran across the road and then pretty much killed over didn't you andy and so yeah andy's seems to have torn his calf muscle and there's an absolute agony. I will admit, and if you watch the Insta stories, I did laugh. And that's partly off the back of, well, it was funny and uh, quite frankly. And, 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 and also, you did laugh at me when I put my back out, put my pants on. <laughs> um, so I think it's an age thing. I think when you get into your 40s, these things happen to the best of us. But you are on the mend, aren't you, Andy? Because we've had a number of people reach out and ask how your leg is. Yeah, I'll be absolutely fine. I've been, I've been, I've been checked over by a medical professional. And while it's a, a fairly serious tear, it will heal itself. No surgery required. I just need to take it easy for the next few weeks. And I should be right for Christmas. But uh, yeah, I just feel embarrassed more than anything. And even Lola, bless her, was looking at me really sheepishly on Monday, looking looking up at me thinking, I'm with this idiot. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it was not good. But anyway, enough of that. Let's get on to the podcast this week. What have we got coming up? So three pieces this week. We're going to start with Harvey is on the podcast. And it's a link back to last week's show where I discussed about how you assess financial products and services. There's a nice link to a new style of life insurance product that we're seeing out there, whereby they're promising to give you back the premiums after a 10-year period. So Harvey's going to go into detail on that, explain why they're not good value for money, even though they might seem it on the surface because of marketing. I'm going to do a piece on investing, and it's about markets being overbought and oversold as indicators. Uh, it's off the back of a, a nice piece of research I did for 8020 investor members, and there's a, a snippet of it that I want to do on the podcast because it was particularly relevant this week. And finally, I'm going to do a piece on when is the best time to buy an annuity. Now, annuities were unpopular. Their old hat almost because of the pension freedoms where people can access their pensions as they want after age 55. And annuities understandably declined in popularity. They already were. But new research has come out that shows 
that there is a point in retirement whereby an annuity could make you happier. So I'm going to cover that on the pod this week. Okay, so let's crack on with the podcast then. And I'm excited to say that we've got Harvey back on the show. Harvey, welcome back to the show. How are you doing? Really well, Andy. Thanks for having me back. So Harvey's back on the show this week because there's a nice link to something that I was talking about last week about how products are made and what to look for and actually be a bit cynical about new products that you find and just try and work out what is it that they want you to do, how they want you to behave. So I gave some examples last week of people with Cool Well. I was talking about, for example, packaged accounts. The banks that provide them don't want you to go and, or they're banking on you, not going and assessing whether you can get all the different benefits more cheaply yourself separately. And they're banking on the idea that you probably won't use any of the products anyway, so cutting the cost. So leading on from that, it was interesting because Harvey and I were having a conversation in the office because Harvey does obviously our protection content. And there are some new products that are out in the marketplace, which Harvey's going to explain, that promise to give you your premiums back on life insurance. And it's a case of dig beneath the surface, you'll find out whether it's good value or not. So Harvey, explain what these products are. Absolutely. So just like you said, Damien, we came across some products that are out there for people to buy that promise a certain amount of life insurance. The life insurance is fairly nominal sums around about the £25,000 mark. But what they do is they promise you all of your premiums back. So in 10 years time, if you haven't died, and you know hopefully you haven't, then you get all your premiums back, which plays into a lot of people's desires to get something back for insurance, because none of us like to pay for products that don't really give us anything in return for the money that we've spent. So that's different to normal life insurance obviously because say you had a term insurance policy you take it out you pay your premiums you're not going to get anything back at the end of the term you only get paid money back from a life insurance policy if you actually die within the agreed term say 10 years for example but that's what the product's there for it's not meant to be an investment i think people sometimes need to change the way they look at life insurance i mean if people look at travel insurance and home insurance they seem to know the value of that as a means of protecting their lifestyle and their family because they know people who've claimed on it and i think either they have or no people have whereas life insurance is different i don't think people readily talk about it if they have claimed on it and let's be honest if someone has their they're dead anyway so it's a case of i think we need to reposition that with people they're always thinking that life insurance is poor value but it's not you're protecting your lifestyle so taking that on then harvey explain how the products actually work and whether you think they do represent value or not. So how you described it is exactly the kind of attraction that these kinds of policies will have for people is that sense that they're getting something back for the money that they're spending. There are products out there that promise lots of different kinds of cash back, but the particular kind of policy that we were looking at promised you all of your premiums back at the end of 10 years. And that's slightly different to most incentive deals out there with life insurance. So what would happen here is you would get about 25 thousand pounds worth of life insurance you'd be covered for 10 years if you didn't die within the 10 years you'd get all your premiums back so that's roughly three thousand pounds now what people don't factor in is that your your money is losing value and so inflation erodes some of the value of your money that you're paying in but what we did was we looked at well what's the equivalent cost of twenty five thousand pounds worth of life insurance over 10 years for somebody if they didn't want their money back. And the astounding thing is, for an average 30-year-old person, that it's not more than two or three pounds a month. So you could have that level of life insurance for two to three pounds a month. And let's say we round it up to five pounds a month even. You've paid 20 pounds a month more for this product, just in the hopes of getting the premiums back at the end of 10 years. So with this new style of product that's out there, if you cancel the policy for example within the 10-year period so after five years you decide i don't want to do this anymore then that's it you don't get any money back do you you've paid your premiums and you've got nothing back and you mentioned the three thousand pounds premiums that would be given back and it was roughly 25 pounds a month which is obviously hugely different from the life insurance policy premiums you mentioned but that 25 pounds a month is that age related anyway because obviously normal life insurance the amount you pay as you said is depends on your age so if you're younger then the life insurance premiums are cheaper with this new style of product is the premium age specific or is it the same for every Yeah, the the rate, Damien, is the same for everyone. So it's a flat £25 per month, which 
more than covers the the cost of an increased age. So if you were older, it's probably not going to cost you anything like £25 a month for £25,000 if covered over 10 years. It's a fairly cheap policy when you look at it on its own without the cashback deal. So what Harvey did, which was effectively deconstruct the concept and say, so if you pay the life insurance, you're going to get the £25,000 back if you died within the 10 years, if you've got a life insurance policy. Well, as Harvey already pointed out, that's only going to cost you even being generous to £5 at most a month. But that left the £20 difference in that premium. You then ran the numbers and compared that to the £3,000 you'd get back in terms of premiums. And what was the result of that? My curiosity led me to think about what I could do with that extra £20 a month. So instead of handing my £20 a month over to an insurance company so that they can invest it, grow it, make money from it, what would I do with that extra £20 a month? So if I just bought myself a normal level term life insurance policy that doesn't offer me any money back, but costs me £5 a month, let's say, and took that extra £20, we looked at examples of where we could perhaps put it into a savings account or even invest that £20 a month. And the reality is that, yes, you may get a little bit less back than you would do from £25 a month paid to this policy that, if it does pay you in 10 years' time, would give you £3,000. But you maintain access to your money. You also maintain control over your money and you're not having to worry about whether this company will still be around in 10 years time to pay your premiums back. And so with the investing route, actually based on the 5% interest rate, looking at the, the numbers, you would, I mean, it's an assumption, marginally be better off and have just over £3,000 at the end of that 10 year period. So what it is, this is just a brilliant example of a product that's marketed in a way that they're banking on you holding a product for 10 years. So they've got access to Basically, your money, they can do what they want with it. You are thinking you're getting a good deal because you get your premiums back if you don't claim. But when you deconstruct it like Harvey did, you could actually be better off at the start of a policy because there are deals out there that can give you cash back, for example, which these sort of policies don't tend to do. Midway through the policy, if you cancelled, well, with these new style of policies that we're starting to see, I mean, they're, they're not everywhere, but we're starting to see them marketed online a bit more. Then you don't get anything back in that 10 year term. But like Harvey said, if you'd been setting aside the balance of the premiums, the 20 pound a month into a savings account or investing it yourself, you've got access to that. And even at the end, if you've been investing the difference in premiums, you would be probably better off or as well off as having the premiums back from the insurer on this new style of product. So I think it was a brilliant example of where you need to dig a little bit deeper on these products and shop around and take a bit of time. So it didn't take you long to look at the premiums, did it, Harvey, to do a bit of research about the premiums on a standard £25,000 life insurance policy for 10 years? It didn't. And I think I'd say a couple more things on that, Damien. One is how many of us need £25,000 worth of life insurance for 10 years? Almost none of us. Most of us that need life insurance during our working lives need in excess of £25,000 because we've got mortgages, children, all kinds of things that would need funding if we were to die. But £25,000 may appeal to an older person who thinks that will cover the cost of a funeral or may cover the cost of, you know, a few things that they need tidying up when they pass away. And the reality is that a 10-year policy isn't the right kind of policy for that kind of need. You probably need an over 50s or a whole of life type of policy. So it's not the right advice. But that then is because these kinds of products aren't regulated. It means that people that buy them aren't covered by the financial services compensation scheme. So if these companies fold, you don't get any money back, you're not protected. So that's another thing I would say to our listeners to look out for is that they should always check that the product is regulated and that they are covered by the financial services compensation scheme. So just to finish off this piece then, Harvey, is there any tips that you'd give people looking for these attractive deals around life insurance? Absolutely. I mean, the key thing is compare the cost of what you're looking at. Things can look very attractive. And I think we've been talking about this a lot in the office, but we all feel slightly begrudged to pay for insurances because, you know, if we don't claim that's money that we've spent, and we've not seen any value for. And actually, a lot of these deals are playing on that sentiment. So they're playing on the fact that you want something in return 
over your money and that can look attractive. So for example, there are policies in the market that market 10% back on your first year's premiums. Compare the cost of that policy with the cheapest policy you can get. More often than not, that 10% cash back in the first year is rolled into the cost of the policy and you may actually end up paying a lot more for your policy over the period of your policy term. And then there are other deals where you can get gifts, cash backs. Again, always just compare with the cheapest product, like for like, without the deal, and see how much money you're really saving. Because insurance companies are not daft. They've usually ruled the cost of that incentive into what they're charging you. And so what we're going to do is also link to a really good article that Harvey's just produced on life insurance with cashback anyway. So it will give you the links to where you should go and get advice to get the best products. So you, someone will do the work for you and recommend suitable products, but you can also get cash back along the way as well. So that will be in the show notes. So that's it, Harvey. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. So moving on to the investment piece now, I wanted to cover a topic that I wrote about for 8020 Investor members. Now, I won't cover everything because that's exclusive to 8020 Investor members. And if listeners want to read that research piece, and of course, they can take out a free trial. But what I want to do is talk about something called the Relative Strength Index, the RSI. And now it is a very useful indicator in determining if the market is likely to rally or collapse, so a turning point that you might be close to a market top or a market bottom. And that's because the RSI is a momentum indicator that's used in technical analysis. And what it does, it measures the price changes to evaluate whether a market or asset is overbought or oversold. So You will have looked at a chart. If you go to Yahoo Finance, for example, it's one of the best free charting websites out there. So if you go and put in something like the S&P 500 into Yahoo Finance, if you just Google the terms S&P 500 and Yahoo, you will be taken to a page that has a chart of the index. Now, if you look at that page, there is an icon that allows you to go into more detail on that chart. And so you could go and look at a very detailed chart of the S&P 500, for example, over any given time frame that you choose. Not only that, you can draw on the charts, you can do trend lines, you can add in moving averages, all sorts of things that form part of technical analysis and might help people make a decision about whether they want to invest or not. And you might notice that below that chart will be another smaller chart that is a wave that's going up and down. That is usually the RSI. You'll see it all over the place. You've probably never really paid much attention to it. And the RSI is a statistical measure that is calculated in a slightly convoluted way. But all it really does, it looks at a market or an index or an asset over a given period of time. So typically, it's 14 days. That's the one that I would look at. And it will Look at the average gain on up days in that period for that particular index and the average loss on down days over that period. And it does a mathematical formula, which then spits out a number between 0 and 100. And then that's displayed as an oscillator on these charts. So if you look at the chart that I mentioned on, say, the S&P 500, the small chart you will normally see below it will see a wave going up and down. And most of the time, that wave sort of ticks up and down, particularly between the numbers 30 and 70. If you recall, I said it runs from 0 to 100 in its entirety. But that oscillating line spends most of its time between 70 and 30. Now, 70 and 30 are the key points on the RSI. And what it can do is, if you think back to this year, and the S&P 500 has been rallying quite strongly. It gets to a point where people are obviously piling in and the price rises are significant. And now what the RSI does is it will flag up if the market is starting to go into overbought territory. And that number is when it's above 70, typically. So as soon as the RSI gets above 70, then that is one indicator that potentially the market could be due a reversal and pull back. Interestingly, in the beginning half of November 2021, we hit that on the S&P 500. And now if you look at markets, we've had a decent pullback in the last couple of weeks for a number of reasons, but partly as well because of Omicron that's been discovered. So from a technical point of view, it was always likely that we might get a pullback. Now, on the bottom end of that, on the flip side, if you see 
the market is falling. So go back to March 2020, when the world was imploding, when COVID was first around, and the stock markets were plummeted to new lows, we saw the S&P 500 crash. And most stock markets fell somewhere between 20 and 30% in a matter of weeks. At that point, the oscillator, the RSI, the 14 day RSI broke below 30. And for a contrarian investor, that would be a sign that it could be a good entry point to buy. And as it turned out, it was a very good entry point to buy. Central banks stepped in, basically underpinned the market with all their easy monetary policy. And the markets rallied to where they ended up in November, the recent highs that we've seen. So the RSI is a very useful momentum indicator that can be used in conjunction with other indicators you might use out there to try and judge where markets are going to potentially reverse and change. So it's really a contrarian indicator. Now, another reason why it's relevant this week, because we saw that indicator hit 30 this week. And again, that was because of Omicron and also because Jerome Powell, the chair of the Federal Reserve in America, stated that the central bank would likely have to taper more quickly, basically remove easy monetary policy, tighten things up. And of course, that was a negative for markets as well. So we saw it hit 30, which from a contrarian investor's point of view was a potential buy sign. Despite all the headlines out there, we hit almost max fear. Uh, I've talked about the CNN Fear and Greed Index on Midweek Market. So go and listen to Midweek Market show this week. I talk about what's been going on. And the Fear and Greed Index is a is another indicator that's out there that really just gives you what motion is driving markets. So it goes from extreme fear to extreme greed, and it's somewhere in between usually. At the moment, it's extreme fear. And it goes back to that famous Warren Buffett investment adage, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. And people at the moment are fearful. So it'll be interesting in the next couple of weeks to see whether the RSI is proved right in this instance, and it's a good entry point for markets. So some people, particularly traders, might use it as an entry and exit point on markets. As long-term investors, we wouldn't place too much emphasis on it. But it is interesting nonetheless for people to go off and explore and potentially use if they want to just for information purposes. Now, there is something else to think about with uh, the RSI 14 is divergences. And I'm not going to dwell on it on this podcast. People can look it up. But the RSI isn't foolproof. There are times where you get overbought or oversold signals flashing and the market doesn't reverse. But it seems to be more likely that a reversal is going to happen when you get a divergence between the index itself and the RSI oscillator. And what I mean is, if imagine that you had the market was falling and that so the S&P 500 in our example was tumbling and the RSI had fallen and it say it hit 30 but then it started to move higher and to a new higher low then that divergence as in the rsi is starting to have an uptrend at the same time as the s p 500 is still tumbling that divergence can be a good sign that a reversal is about to happen and conversely you can get the other way around where maybe the s p 500 or whatever index asset that you want to use is rallying strongly but you see the rsi starting to fall over could be a sign of a potential downturn ahead. So where can you find out about RSI indicators or see the actual numbers? Because you don't have to calculate them yourself. Um, I mentioned Yahoo Finance if you want to draw charts and see them. But also, if you go to investing.com and put in any index, S&P 500, FTSE 100, they display in a table a lot of the technical indicators that are out there, including the RSI 14, and tell you what the number is. And so you can see, is it below 30 or above 70? And then that can inform you of potentially what might happen to markets in the future. But of course, there's no certainty in being able to predict where markets are going to go in the future. Okay, so moving on to the final piece of the podcast then. And Damien, you're going to be talking about annuities and when it could be a good idea to buy them. So Damien, annuities, slightly less popular these days. Yeah, so because of pension freedoms back in 2015, annuities fell out of favour, but they were already in decline anyway. So that was in a large part because of tumbling annuity rates. So the annuity rate is the percentage figure that is used to calculate what your annual income would be if you gave an insurance company your pension pot 
then it would work out how much income they would give you every year. And those rates were falling and they are linked to gilt yields. And that's because gilt yields have been falling, which you can trace back to the financial crisis and beyond the reason why guilt yields have been tumbling and QE and those sorts of things. So they were already in decline. Then pension freedoms came along and opened up the possibility of more people using drawdown or accessing their pension or indeed cashing in their pension. So annuities fell out of favour. But there's been an interesting piece of research done by LCP, which we will link to the paper in the show notes of this podcast and on the website where we put the show on the Money to Masses website, that is. And the research looked into the idea, is there a right time to buy an annuity? And the conclusions are quite interesting. So let me just give you a, a flavor of what they did. They explored the idea of somebody who maybe would be 60 then the attractiveness of them taking out an annuity at that age versus somebody who was maybe in their 70s and 80s doing it. Now, to assess that attractiveness, they effectively used a happiness matrix and they came up with a happiness measure. And there were three factors in it that they said would impact whether people would be willing and happy to have an annuity. One of them was they called upside, which they assumed that people would be happy if their income in retirement goes up rather than goes down, avoiding downside. And that was looking at that people would be unhappy if their annual income falls in retirement and their desire to bequest money. So to leave an inheritance to their heirs. And so how those three things interact change over time. And it also depends on lots of other factors, such as your age, such as investment returns. And they did lots of scenarios where they looked at how those different factors interact and whether people might be happier taking an annuity at a different date in retirement. And the conclusions were quite interesting. One of the things that they suggest is that there's a longevity risk that occurs in retirement. So let's say you are age 60, then on average, you will live another 26 years to age 86. Then the chances of you living twice as long as the average person, so therefore living to 112, are obviously quite low. But conversely, if you think about somebody who was aged 80, then on average, they're expected to live another nine years. So that's to age 89. Now, the chances of them living twice what the average expectation is, so living to 98, is, yeah, it's unlikely, but it's much more likely than the person at age 60 living to 112. If you think of it in another way, the longer you've lived, the more likely that you're going to live longer than the average person. Pretty much you've already been doing it anyway, if that makes sense. So thinking of it like that, somebody who might be using drawdown to fund their retirement income are therefore going to have to keep making judgment calls about how long they're going to live. Well, once you're starting to get to, say, 80 and older, you're now going to have to start making judgments that are based possibly on a non-average life expectancy, if that makes sense. And so that starts causing problems that you may start, therefore, being more frugal than you need to be, taking less of a retirement income, and therefore having a bit more of a difficult retirement than you needed to have, because you're not sure exactly when you're going to die. And the longevity risk increases as you get older. And the difficulty in judging how much to take from your retirement pot becomes more and more difficult. Because in an ideal world, the day you died would be the day you spent your last pound, assuming that you didn't want to leave anything to your children or relatives. And so that in itself starts to become a problem. And that adds to people's unhappiness. So what they did by Looking at all these different scenarios, ages, investment returns, they were able to come up with this idea of what would make people happier, what would become an optimum decision. And you can look at the methodology. It is a little bit heavy, but the conclusions are interesting nonetheless. And what they found is that as people got older, there was a much more attractiveness of switching to an annuity or at least part of their income to an annuity rather than being in drawdown and in fact the magic age which depends on the appetite for risk is on average 67 and so at that point that would be a good time to switch to annuity because it would be much more attractive so the thing is lots of people who reach retirement previously would have looked at annuities at age 55 and age 60 and think they weren't a good deal well the message of this piece of research is that they become a much better deal as you get older don't forget annuity rates also increase the older you get so you get more income for your hundred thousand pound pot at age 70 than you would at age 60 because the insurance company is betting that you won't live as long so you get a higher income 
Now, I did mention it depends on your appetite for risk. So people who are more risk adverse, so they're not as willing to invest in a portfolio that might have a higher equity content, the research advises them to move out of drawdown sooner and that is at age 64, as they're unlikely to have a large enough pot to justify staying invested in the stock market, where somebody who has a much higher appetite to risk, so somebody who says has three quarters of their money in the stock market, should hold on to age 70 before buying an annuity because they can grow their pension more quickly in the early years. So it was an interesting piece of research that I just wanted to throw out there to people. We will link to it, but it's powerful because it highlights that the decision process when you reach retirement isn't a one and done it can be that you decide to go into drawdown it can be that you delay retirement it can be you do a combination of both of those and at some point start to move towards annuities because they become more attractive from an administration perspective from a stress perspective of managing your money but also financially as well so a very interesting piece of research which highlights that you shouldn't just dismiss annuities outright Okay, so that's it. We're done. If you want to get in touch with Damien, you can do so in the usual way. It's Damien at moneytothemasses.com. Of course, Twitter is there. It's at money to the masses with a number two. But really, our favorite right now, definitely Damien's favorite, is Instagram. So if you want to get in touch with Damien on Instagram and interact with all the stuff he's doing on Instagram, and believe me, it's a lot. It seems to be his obsession right now. Do get involved on Instagram and follow Money to the Masses on Instagram as well. Yeah, and I'm doing an advent calendar this year. I'm, every day I'm explaining something in 21 seconds, and you can put in suggestions money related stuff i explain in 21 seconds and you could win a money to the masses mug so that is it andy as you said until next time until next time oh.